guys, it's Lena Blade from Refine Horizons, and this is the second video I'm doing about uh, Brown's Boundary Control and Legal Principles, Chapter 1. This book right here, Boundary Surveying Bible. <laughs> so I want to get back into Chapter 1. So the next uh, key concept I had in Chapter 1 was uh, essentially they go, they go through... Uh, some basic principles of real estate law for land surveyors, and, and they give you some of the history of where that law came from. And so I'm just going to go through some key points from, from that review. Um, he talks a lot about easements uh, in Chapter 1. I'm going to break that out in a separate video because there's a huge amount of information on easements there that's important for land surveyors, but we'll put that in a separate video. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to review the kind of the background and basic concepts of real estate law for land surveyors, except for easements. We'll do easements in another video. So the first thing that Brown's, one of the, the first important things Brown tells us about real estate law, legal concepts, is there's a difference between title, rights, and interest in land. And then he explains. So title is the means or vehicle by which one becomes an owner of real estate. So title is how you prove that you're an owner, just like title to your car. Okay. Rights to land, land rights. Um, in Brown's definition, those are, are things that you get to do by nature of being the owner of land. So it's a little bit different from the way the book on land tenure, chapter one and two, talks about land rights. So it's different. They're making a distinction there. So in Brown's, land, the rights that you have as a landowner become come by nature of your being an owner. Okay. So for example, if I own a piece of mountain property, I have the right to harvest the timber, I might have the right to pay for gold in the creek, I might have, you know, I have the right to build a cabin on that property, those are things I have, those are rights I have by nature of being the owner, okay? Interests in land, in Brown's definition, are, are rights to land that, that don't come just through the nature of being the owner. So those are rights that have been acquired from the owner in land, okay, or rights defined in another person's land under our legal system. For example, the government has the right to take your land for public use. Okay. So in Browns, those are called interests in land, whereas rights are, are things that, that are inherent to owning the land. So a little bit different from the book on land tenure. Okay, so just to review, title, that's how you prove you own the land. Rights, land rights, that's the things that you naturally are able to do or that are inherent to your ownership of the land. They're, they're what being a landowner allows you to do under our legal system. And then interest in land, those are rights to do something with, with land that you do not own. So you have an interest in someone else's land. Okay. So they go in and they talk a little bit about the history of our common law. Okay, so American common law, most of it comes from England. Okay, in England, uh, you know, the king took all the land. I've got a whole, I've done talks about William the Conqueror and what he did, but essentially the king owned all the land and then he would give land out to his buddies. And, but they owed him, they owed him things for that land. So in the, uh, Brown's talks about in medieval England, there were four types of obligation that were owed by nobles who were granted land by the king. So these were military or knight service. So you'd have to provide the king with knights. Spiritual service, you have to pray for the king. Uh, what they call uh, soakage, non-military duties, such as the provisions of, of crops and cattle. And sergeanty, hopefully I'm saying these right, which means providing personal services to the king. So if you're a blacksmith, you could go work on the king's metal stuff, whatever. Okay, so those are the four types of obligations. And we really are only left with one of those now. We have the, uh, the non-military duties, such as the provisions of crops or cattle, which we know in our modern society as payment of property taxes. Okay, so then he talks about uh, what, a, what a fee simple estate is. A fee simple estate in real property, he says, is the highest and greatest estate in land that one can obtain. And he talks about that, the fee simple estate, each one of those words has a specific meaning. So let me go through those. So fee, F-E-E, -E, denotes a real estate that can be inherited. So if it's a fee estate, that means you can pass that land on to your son or daughter. And that was really important because in early medieval history, English medieval history, uh, when you died, your son and daughter didn't get your land. That land went back to the king and he could give it to, a, to another one of his buddies. 
And so the ability to pass land on to your sons or daughters is really important. It was an important right that nobles eventually won from the king. That's where we get that word fee. That's what fee means. It means you, you can pass your land on to your heirs. Simple means that the owner and not the sovereign is free to determine who inherits that land. Okay, So uh, it used to be the king uh, could tell you who was going to get your land after you died. So it would be one of your heirs, but the king picked, the king decided who it was. So simple means, no, simple means you get to choose, not the king, okay? So fee means it can be inherited. Simple means you get to decide who inherits, not the king, okay? And then absolute means there's no time limits on the ownership. So, again, in, in medieval history, uh, you might be granted a land, the, the land, the king might only give you the land for a certain period of time. Usually it was your lifetime, but there could be other periods of time. And so fee simple estate really means you get to own that land, give it to who you want, without the government say so, and that land is yours and your heirs until you essentially sell it or dispose of it, give it away. Okay? So that's what fee simple absolute means. Uh, real property, what is real property in our legal system? It's essentially land, right? Land and things permanently attached to the land. Okay? It's distinct from what we call personal property. Okay, so... Uh, real property is governed by the statute of frauds, so we have special rules for real estate that we don't have for personal property. So one of those, the statute of frauds says uh, real estate has to be conveyed in writing. So you can't just orally convey property as a general rule, um, which you can do with a lot of personal property. Um, again, he, he talks about the fact that real estate in our legal system has three dimensions, so length, width, height, and depth. So that's important. Uh, real, rights to real property can also have a span in time. So you might give somebody a right in your land over a limited period of time. Uh, there can be more than one uh, ownership in a single parcel of land. So, for example, somebody can own the surface rights and somebody can own the mineral rights. They talk about that too in the book on land tenure. I can, look, I can own land um, in, as a co-owner with somebody. So for example, my wife and I own my house and my little piece of land here in Stockton as tenants in common or joint tenants. Okay, so we both own it. Um, let's see. Land ownership comes with responsibilities in our legal system. One of those responsibilities is that you have to pay your taxes, pay your property taxes. Um, let's see. There's several types to rights to land. Those include easements, licenses, covenants, and servitudes. Okay, easements, licenses, covenants, and servitudes. Um, I'm going to just briefly touch on easements, then we're got a whole another set. We're going to do a whole another video on easements. But easements are the spe uh, specific right to use somebody else's land um, that you do not own. A license is like an easement, only it's temporary and it can be revoked at any time. Okay, an easement is more permanent. That's all we're going to say about easements. I'm going to come back and do another video. So then he talks about covenants and servitudes. Covenants are agreements between parties that restrict the use of land or impose obligations related to the land. So those are private agreements. We usually see them in deeds. And so usually we, what we hear today in modern uh, real estate is CCNRs, covenants. I can't remember the other C, but it's covenants and restrictions. Um, so a covenant is just an agreement between private parties that they will or will not do things with their land. So usually when you when you buy land in a modern master plan development, there's a whole set of rules that, you know, they tell you what color you can paint your house and how many times a week you got to mow your lawn and all that stuff. Those are That's not a government restriction. That's a private restriction between private parties. Those are called covenants. Okay, so I'm going to end the video now, and we'll start another video. I'm going to talk, well, you know what? I want to go over governing law for boundary surveys, and then we'll do a video just on easements. So the last thing I had in here, uh, last key concept from Brown's chapter one was he talked about which laws govern boundary surveys, and uh, it you know this you learn a lot about this in your CFEDS too, who has federal sur survey authority and who doesn't. But basically, uh, boundary surveying in the United States is governed at the state level, so it's state law or common law. Okay, and common law too is at the state level, so it, there is no federal law of surveying that tells me as a land surveyor how I have to do my work. I'm governed by the principles of common law, and of course I'm regulated as a licensed land surveyor at the state level. The state has rules about how I have to survey. 
They also regulate subdivisions. So in California, we have the Subdivision Map Act. Okay, so most of the laws that I have to worry about as a state surveyor are, are state-based. They're either statute from my state or common law from my state court decisions that judges in my states have made. Okay, so an exception to that rule is rules that have to do with the public land survey system, which is a whole other topic we're not going to get into detail about. But essentially, if you're like me and you work in a public land state, so that's almost everything west of the Mississippi, uh, you got to know about how the rules that govern how the public land survey system was surveyed because we have to, we're have trying to retrace the steps of the original survey, right? And so those are rules that were made at the federal level because that was a federal program. Um, he mentions that in most states, boundary surveying is, most of boundary surveying is governed by common law, not by statute. So most rules of land surveying are not codified. They're not in the civil code or the business and professions code. It's in common laws and in judge-made law, court, court decisions. This is why this book is so important, because it tells us what judges have decided about how we need to survey. And then we talked about how states states do regulate the subdivision of land in most places. So we have to pay attention. That's usually statute. That's not common law. Those are codified rules that we have to follow. In California, we have the Subdivision Map Act. Okay? All right, so we'll do another video, and uh, we'll go over the information on easements that Browns has in Chapter 1.